okay uh, our class uh, this is a course of Ethiopian geography in the horn and this course comprises eight chapters um, which the first chapter is about introduction to Ethiopian geography in the horn um, chapter two uh, is all about the geology of Ethiopia and the Horn. Chapter three um, is the topography of Ethiopia and the Horn. And chapter four deals about the drainage systems and water resources of Ethiopia and the Horn. And chapter five is all about the climate of Ethiopia and the Horn. Chapter six is about soils, natural vegetation, and wildlife resources of Ethiopia and the Horn. Chapter 7 is about population of Ethiopia and the Horn. And the last chapter is about economic activities in Ethiopia. Now, we'll start from chapter 1, which deals about introduction to Ethiopian geography and the Horn. Now in here, first we'll begin from definitions given to the subject of geography. Geography could be defined as it is a systematic study of the earth that describes and analyzes spatial and temporal variations of physical biological and human phenomena and their interrelationships and dynamism over the surface of the earth. So, the scope, approaches and themes of geography could be seen as it is a holistic and interdisciplinary field of study contributing to the understanding of the changing spatial structures from the past to the future. So in geography, we study what has been seen in the past and will go to the future. Thus, the scope of geography is the surface of the Earth, which is a very thin zone, that is the interface of the atmosphere, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, and the biosphere. In here, the lithosphere refers to the outer part of the Earth, or what we call it in the crest, the hard cover of the Earth, and hydrosphere refers to the water bodies, and the biosphere is all about the habitable zone in which humans are able to live. So, geography will have five basic themes, namely location, plus, human interact, environment interaction, movement, and region. So in geography, we are interested to see all this location, the place, the human environment interaction, okay, the interaction that exists between humans and that of the environment, uh, movement, and finally, on regions. Let's begin from location. Location is nothing. Simply, it is defined as a particular place or position. Location can be of two types. One, it could be absolute location, and the other could be a relative location. In the former case, meaning that, related to the absolute location, the location of a place is defined by its latitude and longitude or its exact address. Here are two important pointers latitude and longitude. Referring to place, place refers to the physical and human aspects of a location. So each place in the world will have its unique characteristics expressed in terms of landforms, hydrology, biogeography, pedology, referring to by pedology, we mean that the soil types characteristics size of its human population and the distinct human culture. So when we talk about place, all this is to be seen under it. What kind of landform exists? What does the hydrology look like? What is the biogeography of that area? 
And what does the spoiled cat look like? And what are the characteristics and size of its human population? Okay? Because human population varies from place to place. And what are the distinct human cultures in that specific place? So the concept of place aids geographers to compare and co contrast two areas on Earth. Now, when it comes to location, shape, and size of Ethiopia and the Horn, the Horn of Africa is a region of Eastern Africa. The Horn refers to the Horn of East Africa. It is a narrow tip that protrudes into, protrudes that enters into the Northern Indian Ocean, separating it from the Gulf of Aden. So it is the easternmost extension of the African land defined as the region that is home to the countries of Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia, whose cultures have been linked throughout their long history. So the Horn of Africa belongs to countries like that of Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and that of Somalia. So in terms of size, of all these countries in the Horn, Ethiopia is the largest of all, and Djibouti is the smallest. But when it comes to vicinical location of Ethiopia, Sudan is to the west and northwest, South Sudan is to the southwest of Ethiopia, Djibouti is to the east of Ethiopia, Somalia to the east and southeast, Eritrea to the north and northeast, and that of Kenya to the south of Ethiopia. In relation to water bodies and land masses, okay, this horn is found southwest of the Arabian Peninsula, south of Europe, northwest of the Indian Ocean, and that of within the Nile Basin. Now, the implications of the location of Ethiopia are described as follows. Now, related to climate, the fact that Ethiopia is located between 3 degrees north and 15 degrees north between the equator and Tropic of Cancer, meaning Tropic of Capricorn is to the south, that is uh, below the, 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 the center of the, the, the Earth, implies that the country has a tropical climate so modified by its altitude. So the location of Ethiopia relative to the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and the African and Asian landmass has also various bearings on the climate of Ethiopia. So they do have an impact here on the location of Ethiopia. Second, when we talk about implications of location, what we have to see is about social cultural conditions. Ethiopia is one of the earliest recipients of the major world religions, namely Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, due to its proximity to the Middle East, which was the origin of these religions. So we know these dominant religions were first to be seen in this area. The linguistic and the cultural relationships which Ethiopia shares with its neighbors reflect the influence of location. So because of these locations, they do have this kind of impact. Three, the political condition. The political history of Ethiopia has been considerably influenced by one, geopolitical consideration of superpowers. This refers to that the superpowers need this horn because the horn of Africa has its own geopolitical advantage. Two, its adjacency to the Red Sea, meaning that the Red Sea is one of the major global trade routes where many ships are to go through. Three, the Middle East geopolitical paradigms, because the Middle East is the area where the major powers of the world will have an interest because of its natural resources. And more, as a result, Ethiopia has been exposed for external invasions in a number of times. So many invaders have tried to invade or conquer Ethiopia and they tried to make under their control. So this is the political condition or the geopolitical location of 
of the country is uh, attractive to external powers. The other issue that has to be discussed in relation to this is that the size of Ethiopia. Of course, Ethiopia within the whole is the largest in terms of its size. So it has a total area of approximately 1,106,000 square kilometers and is as the largest country in Africa and the 20th largest country in the world. Look how Ethiopia do have a very wide, wide uh, area coverage. Moreover, it extends about 1,639 kilometers east-west and 1,577 kilometers north-south. That's about 0.7 of the country is covered by water beds. The size of Ethiopia also affects both the natural and human environment of the country. So, having this large size do have an advantage and a disadvantage. Some of the advantages of having a large size is one, it possesses diverse agroecological zones. So you will have different agroecological zones so that you will have a variety of you no know, crops to grow. Two, a variety of natural resources. Having a large size meaning that, okay, the country can possess huge natural resources. Three, it owns extensive arable land. The arable land refers to the land that will be cultivated, or the land that is to be used for cultivation is called an arable land. Four, we will have larger population size. The larger or the greater the area size, meaning that the larger the population size. Four or five, it is a home for diverse cultures. So you'll find different cultures in Ethiopia. And the last one, greater depth in defense external invasion. So when you have this, you know, you try to strengthen your defense force. On the contrary, having a large size will have some disadvantages. One, it will demand greater capital to construct infrastructure facilities. Like what? Like water supply, like transport, like electricity, and so on and so forth. So it demands huge capital. Two, it requires large army to protect its territory. If the country's territory, okay, if the country is too large, meaning that to defend its country, that country from external aggressors, you need to have a large army, and this will be so costly. Three, it is difficult for effective administration because of distance between or among different social groups. And also, it's difficult for social economic integration because of, you know, the vastness of the country. Now, the shape of Ethiopia and its implication could be seen. Countries of the world, in relation to, countries of the world have different kinds of shapes that can be divided into five main categories. One is compact. Some countries do have a compact shape. The other one is fragmented. The other one elongated. And fourth, perforated and that of. The last one is protruded. So these shapes have implications on defense, administration, and economic integration within the country having. Example, compact shaped countries. In compact shaped countries, the distance from the geographic center to step to any of the borders does not vary greatly because of its compactness. So this is in turn is easier for defense, for social economic and cultural integration. So compact shaped countries will have these kind of advantages. Second, fragmented shaped countries. They are divided from their other parts by either water, land, or other countries. Since they are fragmented, there are areas that will enter within the country. That could be a water body or a land mass. Elongated shaped countries 
are geographically long and relatively narrow, like Chile. For example, if you take Chile, simply it's elongated, so the north south extension will be very, very long. Perforated shaped countries, the countries that completely surrounded another country, like the Republic of South Africa, is called perforated because it's surrounded, it surrounds other countries. And the last one, protruded shaped countries are countries that have one portion that is much more elongated than the rest of the country, like Myanmar and Eritrea. Because in this kind of countries, or protruded shaped countries, they enter into <coughs> sorry, they enter into another area or another part. It could be a water body or a land mass. Now, under the introductory part, the other thing that we like to see is about basic skills of map reading. Map reading is very important for geography. If a geographer doesn't have the skill of map reading, it would be difficult for him to identify areas or locations. So what is a map? A map is nothing. Simply it is a two-dimensional scaled representation of part of the whole of the earth surface on a flat body such as a piece of paper, blackboard, wood, or cloth. So simply map reading encompasses systematic identification of natural features and man-made features. So when we have an understanding of map reading, it would be very simple for us to differentiate natural features from that of man-made features. So, by natural features, we mean that it's like, or it includes mountains, plateaus, hills, valleys, rivers, oceans, rocks, plains, etc., etc. Whereas, man-made features include like roads, railways, buildings, dams, and so on and so forth. Since these features cannot be easily observed, and interpreted in real landscapes, maps are essential to geographers. So, in order to see these natural or man-made features, map is very essential or important because if you don't have the map, we cannot see these features on the real world. So, what is what would be the importance of maps? One. Maps provide the basis for making geographical details of regions represented. That is, the geographical factors of an area, such as the relief, or the drainage pattern, or the settlement pattern, etc., etc. Two, maps are useful for giving location of geographical features by varied methods of grid references, place namings, etc etc. So map makes storage of the geographical data of areas represented. So we store them, these geographical data. So maps are very important. Hence, maps could be divided into two. Well, into one, topograph topographical maps. This kind of maps will simply depict one or more natural and cultural features of an area. It shows topographic issues. Contents of topographical maps depend on purpose of a map, the scale of a map, data of compilation, how it was compiled, and the nature of the land represented will be seen on topographic maps. Two special purpose or statistical maps show the distribution of different aspects such as temperature to show the difference in temperature from, of one place from the other, it could be the rainfall distribution or the settlement pattern of population or the vegetation cover because vegetations do vary from area to area. Therefore, these special purpose or statistical maps are very important. So in part, in, 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 in reading map, we need the following, marginal information on maps or elements of maps. What would a map contain is a question. Any map should have one, a title. It is 
the heading of uh, the Google map, which tells what the map is all about. So there has to be a title on the map. Two, a map should have its own key or legend. It is the list of all conventional symbols and signs shown on the map with their interpretation. Okay? So you need to have a legend that will explain which sign represents what. So we need to have a key. Three, scale. It is the ratio between the distance on the map and the actual ground distance. So you need to put it on the map. Like for example, one centimeter on a map will represent 100,000 kilometers on the ground. Or one centimeter on a map will represent 500,000 kilometers. This is meant by a scale. So a scale enables the map user to interpret the ground measurement like road distance, area size, the gradient of something, and so on and so forth. The fourth is the narrow, the north arrow. It is indicated with the north direction on the map used to know the other important direction of the map are like east, west, south, or west. So you need to put the north arrow. So by looking the north arrow and then you will see or you will try to find which part is east, which is west, which part is south, and which one is north. And finally, margin is the frame of the map. It is important, it's important for showing the end of the map area because it has to delineate, it has to show the end of that specific map. So that there has to be a margin on a map. So these are very important. And finally, any map should show the date of compilation. That is, it is a date of map publication. When, when was that map made or published? Because maps or map making could be changed from time to time because of different reasons. This enables map users to realize whether the map is outdated or are updated. Okay? So, by looking this or the date of compilation, we can simply say that this map is updated or this map is outdated. So, these are very important in relation to map reading. So, what are the basic principles of map reading? Map readers must have ideas about the simple and also the real world or landscapes. He or she has to know. Two, every map symbol must be visualized by the reader to read a map. Three, map symbols should be introduced as needed. Secondly, knowledge of direction is an important principle in reading maps that we need to incorporate. Okay, and finally, one of the basic functions of maps is to help us to orient ourselves and to locate places on there. So, map reading will enable us to locate places on... Uh, so, map reading is very important. So, that is all about introduction of Ethiopia and the whole under chapter 1.